Hey everybody, how's it going? So lately I've been seeing a lot of fan casting, different videos about the Fantastic Four moving into the MCU. So it just had me thinking about the Fantastic Four as a, as a comic book and wanting to kind of revisit the original series and read the first issue. It's been forever since I've kind of looked at this very first issue and so I figured I'd go through it and give you a like, quick little review. The issue starts off with the citizens of New York City even though they seem to call it Central City, so I don't know if that's just a part of New York or if that's or if, they, or, or if originally it was not set in New York. Kind of confusing there. But anyway, uh, the citizens, like the cops, they see a big flare shoots up in the sky and it says the words, the Fantastic Four. Which is pretty crazy because how do you shoot a flare that spells out a whole word? That's pretty sci-fi in and out of itself. Uh, and then, you know, we have this kind of cool zoom in uh panel of a shadowy figure that you can't really see his facial details but it's, it looks like a lanky man he's holding a, a still smoking flaring, flare gun and this is basically Reed Richards it's a very weird Reed Richards though it doesn't look like Reed Richards as we know him now I'm pretty sure anybody that's familiar with the way the Fantasy Four look if they saw this they'd be like who is that guy they would never guess Reed Richards it's just a, it's a very interesting look he's very it's a lot more lanky he's a lot more uh which kind of goes with his whole stretchy power, I guess. But yeah. Reed makes a funny comment about it. This is the first time he's had to use a flare, and hopefully it'll last. Which is kind of interesting, because if you know anything about the history of this book, that Stan Lee was getting ready to quit Marvel at the time, because he was being forced to write like books that he didn't feel were up to his level of intellect. So his he was about to quit, but his wife said, "If you're gonna do, if you're gonna quit, just write a book the way you want to write it." So he wrote this, and the rest is history. We then get about one or two pages dedicated to each member of the team seeing the meshes in the sky and suiting up, so to speak, even though none of them have costumes. Uh, we see a very primitive-looking thing where he actually looks more, much more like a monster than he ever does, which is kind of interesting. It's actually weird. It's kind of interesting that later on they make him look more uh, humanoid and you know friendly. Where in this, his face is, his head structured in a way that makes him look much more monstrous. He also doesn't look like he's. To me, he doesn't look like he's made of stone. He looks more like he's made of like mud or clay. It's interesting. It looks almost more like Clayface than what we know the thing to look like. We also get a moment of the Human Torch flaming on and shooting out of a car. Uh, his design is also very primitive, so to speak. He, you can't. There's no facial details. He just looks like a big fiery flame, which is kind of interesting. I like the designs, honestly. Um, and then you got Sue Storm. She like turns invisible, runs through a crowd of people, knocking people down. Uh, and it's kind of interesting with her design because they they do this thing where they, it's like these little dots, almost like almost like a connected dot thing, and. Growing up, I've always accepted that that's what invisible people look like, <laughs> but it's just a weird, it's an interesting way that they decided to use to display that she's invisible within the art of the comic. I also love how they all cause a considerable amount of, of chaos while they're trying to get to the fight, or get to where Reed summoned them. I mean, Sue Storm definitely has the least amount of things, because she just knocks over a few people and basically steals a taxi, but... The thing straight up like gets shot at. He he attacks some cops. He destroys through the he goes through the sword system and destroys the road, destroys a car. The Human Torch gets in a fight with like aerial forces from the National Guard. Indivertly destroys a couple of jets by by flying through them, and his heat powers is burned right through it. I do love the effect that they use to to, to show that he's melting the, the airplanes. It looks really cool. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty crazy that they all cause this much destruction for just going through the town. They then send a heat-seeking hunter missile after the Human Torch. Now, they said this was the National Guard, and this is right inside the city, so like, how does that work? The National Guard just has jets ready at the helm that can fly into the city on a moment's notice. Do they also have rockets, missiles that have nuclear warheads on them? Because they say in the the words that is a rock a nuclear powered missile that's just insane but what's even more insane is that the missile is caught by Mr. Fantastic reaches up and grabs it it's hilarious because in the panel before it looks like they're straight up up in the sky with airplanes like my, hundreds of thousands of miles in the sky and all of a sudden 
Reed's hands grab the rocket and now it looks like you can see the skyscraper so now it looks like they're only maybe you know 100 feet up in the air or whatever 200 feet whatever which is ridiculous because airplanes wouldn't fly that low to the to skyscrapers so this whole scene is just ridiculous and then Reed throws the missile into the water which what how close is the water <laughs> we then proceed to get the origin back story of the of the team uh, which is kind of weird that they put it right in the middle of this of the issue like this and not you think they'd put it at the beginning, but they decided just to flash back to it, oddly enough. It's also, it's also interesting that they would even do this in the first issue. A lot of comics back, then, back during this time didn't do that. You know, you usually got the origin later on after the series was, you know, actually greenlit or popular enough. I mean, Bat we didn't get like a true origin for Batman until like a couple years after he was created. This is a very iconic moment though. Uh, this has been mimicked and parodied and copied in so many different forms of media over the years. You know, the whole falling out of the spaceship and realizing they have powers. It's almost done in a very like horror, mo horror movie way. Like they're just, they're so horrified at what they can do or what's happened to them. You also get the great moment where the thing turns into the thing. He gets so angry and he starts attacking. Reed, he starts being mad at Reed for everything. It's really interesting because he also gets mad because he's like, I think Sue actually calls him a monster, which is pretty, un pretty uncensored of her to begin with. But he's like, I'll show you a monster. You married this weakling and stuff, and you should have married me or something like that. It's really interesting because I never remember them having like a jealousy thing in this. Like, I could be mistaken, but I don't remember there being, like, a love triangle between them. And I don't remember Ben ever having feelings for Sue, but eh, whatever. It's interesting. Then the story shifts back to the present where a bunch of monsters are coming out of this island called Monster Island. Go figure, right? And they're attacking these soldiers that are on Monster Island for some reason. Not really clear. And so the Fantastic Four have to come over and see what's going on. The team basically gets split up. Um, you have Sue and Ben are on the surface level fighting some monsters while Johnny and uh, Reed are exploring the underground caves or whatever when they get knocked out and they wake up and there are these weird suits that I'm assuming are supposed to be like radioactive suits or something. It's not made, It's never made clear why they're putting the suits, why they need to wear the suits. And later on, they just take them off, and there's there's absolutely no penalty for so doing so. So I really don't understand like why that was even drawn into the book. Uh, we get introduced to the mole man who's been living here, and he's somehow created an army of uh, monsters, and he he controls them now. Yeah, just we're just supposed to go with that. I love how this book even takes the time to give a origin for the mole man, like. There's two origin stories within this one first issue in a main story. It's that's a lot of content to pack into one issue. Mole Man then challenges either Reed or Johnny to a fight, a stick fight. It's kind of hard to tell because they're both wearing the suit and they both look exactly the same when they're drawn this way. But I would imagine it's supposed to be Reed because why would he challenge Johnny? It just seems more like Reed would be the one. Anyway, they get to a fight. Uh, all of a sudden, the thing and Sue come in and the thing's about to attack Mole Man. Mole Man runs away, rings his bell. A bunch of monsters come out attacking them. Uh, they run for it. The Human Torch basically uh, melts the tunnel behind them so the monsters get stuck in there. It's an avalanche. Uh, the Mole Man, uh, Reed grabs the Mole Man, but then the Mole Man gets away and they're like, what happened? And Reed says, I let him go. He'll never hurt anyone ever again. I'm sitting there thinking, what? What does that even mean? It's almost like Stanley is trying to imply that Reed Richards just killed the Mole Man or left him for dead on purpose. And I'm like, man, that's really dark and seems out of character. At least, well, we don't well, we don't really know what, what Reed's character is, but at this point, but you know, looking back. Uh, so overall, what I like, what I like about this issue, I really like the the character designs, the early character designs of the team. Um, you know, like it's a it's a cool story. I mean, there's lots of co cool sci-fi elements. I mean, the monster designs are amazing as well. The writing is, it's good for the time, it's definitely not nothing amazing by today's standards. The writing doesn't have as many of the cliches that a lot of these early 60s or earlier comic books have. Um, there's also a, here's, or, there's a line that Ben has earlier in the issue that I really enjoy where he says he's at a clothing store and he's looking for clothes and 
The guy says they don't have anything big enough for him. In which Benjamin replies, the world's too small for me. Which is really, I really love that line because it kind of has a dual meaning. You know, obviously it means, like literally it means that he can't find clothes or things for a person his size because the world's not made for him. But it's also interesting because it, you know, you can kind of you can look at it from like a psychological standpoint, where he's this hideous monster that doesn't fit in society, and so the world's not made. The world's too small for him. Like the world's too small-minded for him now. I do love that line. So art, I will part. Art, I would honestly give it an eight out of ten, just because I really enjoy the creative monster designs and character designs. Um, Writing-wise, I would probably give this about probably a five or six it's it's all right not nothing crazy though and then for in terms of story progression and plot i think the issue just it just does too much it's trying to do way too much in what it has to in, in its time span there's way too much time spent in the opening uh moments of them getting together there's also like it's really weird that they do the the origin in the middle of the issue i think that's very oddly placed so for that, I would give the plot and the pacing of the book probably like a three. <laughs> also, it really just breaks the tension, you know, and I'm sure it raises questions, like especially for first-time readers back in the day, they're probably like, what? I want to know more about this particular event, and then it just goes back to the present. It's like, what? I don't know. It just seems like it would be hard to follow and hard to keep the focus of the audience with that, the way it breaks up like that. Um, also, I just think that like the the best part of the issue is the is the last act when they go to Monster Island and that's the part we get a lease of, and that's and that's not set up very well compared to the rest of the issue. Thank you everybody for checking out this uh this revisit. If there's any other classic comic book stories you want me to revisit, definitely let me know. I'm definitely planning on doing more of these as I go. Uh, I just I just picked up this you know cool hardcover uh, collection of early Fantastic Four stories, so I'll probably do a few more Fantastic Four issues by the time uh, you know I'm done with that. Thank you guys for watching, and see you guys later.